today and tonight, and you say, well, Brother Derek, that's a different subject for a Sunday, and I, I was, this is something I wanted to teach on Wednesday night, but I, I, some Wednesday nights we don't have a whole, whole lot of people here, and I know more people need to hear about marriage and the issues that married couples are facing today. I, I believe that with all of my heart. So today we're going to preach to you on wise up about marriage. Wise up about marriage. And we know that in the book of Proverbs, it is a book of wisdom. And we know that Proverbs is written by Solomon. Solomon is one of the wisest men in the Bible. He asked for that wisdom. And there in the book of Proverbs, pretty much what this study is, is we went, I went through the book of Proverbs and I began to read different things that could apply to marriage. I took them out. We categorized them. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. Wising up about marriage. So the book of Proverbs, if you'll just go to the very beginning of that book, because I ain't going to give you a text yet. I am going to talk to you more throughout the message, and this is going to be a little different probably than what you've heard. I'm not going to be as fast or upbeat as I usually am. We're just going to try to get this in. But today, I want you to understand who this message is for, all right? Today, this message is for all married people. But also, this message today is for all who wish to get married one day. Anybody? Okay, you understand what I'm saying? Also, this message is for those who have family members or friends that are married. This message is also for those who know how to spell marriage and for those who don't. Who's this message for? Everybody. Amen. Just because it's a subject of marriage, don't try to isolate it to one group. This is for everybody. And also, we're going to look at this today. I want your marriage to go from, from surviving to thriving, all right? So in the book of Proverbs, just hold on there for a few moments. Let me lay my introduction. But as we know it throughout the Bible, when it comes to this beautiful subject of holy matrimony, and uh, I look throughout different things and begin to study throughout Scripture the mind of God, and I've been doing a little study on marriage as of here recently, but have you ever seen a married couple that has been married for years? I mean, and they're just a beautiful example of marriage. And you say something like this. I tell you one thing. That's just a lucky couple. You ever heard anybody say that or make reference to by, hey, they're just lucky. They have such a beautiful marriage. It is something that is so gorgeous, something so well put together. And we say something like that. Man, they are just so lucky. But today I want to defeat that mentality today as marriage being something that is just by mere luck. Marriage is not a luck thing. A successful marriage is not a lucky thing. It's not the lottery. It's not a scratch ticket. It's nothing that you can just go hope. Maybe he's saying, look, if I marry this one, and maybe it's the right one, or maybe it's not the right one. Marriage takes a four-letter word. It's called W-O-R-K. Marriage takes work. And I guarantee you today, for I know we've got some in this church that have been married for many years, and they would tell you today that it took work to be faithful, it took work to be established, and it took work to be what that couple is now today. But we would understand that in America, if we were to be honest, that marriages are hurting. And let's not just try to seclude that to the world. I'm telling you, I've done enough traveling and preaching that I know that people's marriages are hurting even in the house of God. I've counseled people. I've sat down with people. I've talked to people that have just committed adultery. I've talked to many different individuals. I've talked to those that were talking about leaving their wives or their husbands. I've talked to different ones, and I've tell you today, my friend, there are people that even come to church every single Sunday is that their marriage is not the example that it is supposed to be. It is not what God intended for it to be. It is supposed to be a display. The husband is to love the wife as Christ loves the church. How much did Jesus love the church? He died for it. He shed His blood for it. He went to Calvary for it. So us as men, we need to understand today that we are to love our wives to the place that I'm even willing to give my own life. I'm willing to give up my own comforts. I'm willing to give up my own ideas. I'm willing to give up my own agendas that we can make that marriage work, that she can be what she needs to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've talked to different people and I've heard these exact terms when it comes to counseling people. I hear people say something like this, I feel trapped in this marriage. Think about that. They say, I feel trapped. I feel as if I am trapped in a marriage that God never intended. But I tell them, don't you hit the quit button yet, my friend. It's not that easy. You've got to work at it. You say, hey, hear me today, friend. Love is something that you've got to work at today now, my friend. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I just don't love them anymore. And if you say that, the reason you don't love them anymore is because you quit reading your Bible. It's because you quit praying through. It's because you yet to show the unconditional love that God wants you to show. Jesus loved me when I was 
pathetic. Jesus loved me when I was worthless. And we've got to love each other because marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. And we've got to make sure our marriages. I've heard people say, I feel trapped in a marriage. I've heard people say, my marriage is stale. I've heard people say, I feel like throwing in the towel. I've heard people say that I cannot make it work anymore. And they begin to use that word divorce back and forth. If Even if they don't say it verbally, it is a thought that is in their mind. They make it an option. They make it something in their mind. But let me tell you something today, friend. You better remove the quit option out of your marriage. You better remove the quit option out of your marriage. It's not an optional thing that you can just try it out a different way. God wants you to be faithful. God wants you to make it work. We've got to make sure today, my friend, that we have to make sure that our marriages are what God has intended for them to be. Now, nobody really likes divorce. You're going to have a hard time convincing me that somebody goes to an altar, they say their vows, they go to the altar, they say, I love you, they spend all that money, and in the back of their mind say, I can't wait to get divorced and get hurt and my heart broken. I don't think that is there. Nobody really likes this term of divorce. But do you know that the American statistics, divorce is 50 plus percent in America? That many people. That means that in this church, that one out of two marriages are going to work. Only 50 percent of marriages end up working in the United States of America. And I'll tell you this, God's not pleased with it, and we should not be pleased with it. God's not pleased with it, and we should not be pleased with it. Our God desires holy matrimony still to be sanctified and have sanctity in it. So we understand today, we've got to learn to protect our marriage. Amen? Now, why is marriage protection, all in favor of marriage protection, say amen. (laughs) Why is marriage protection so important? I'll tell you, number one, is because our government is making laws that undermine marriage. Think about it. Every day laws are being passed. The same-sex marriage law. We understand that that is not the will of God. Also, my friend, the government, my friend, I've talked to many different couples that are not married but living together. Millions are in America. And I say, why don't you get married? They say, well, we we like the subsidies and we like the benefits we get from the government. And if we get married, we cannot get those subsidies and benefits from the government. I thought to myself, are you that cheap? That you'd rather get a stale check to get some groceries than have the favor of God? Oh yes, I know this may seem a little solid and it may maybe touch a touch into my own family, believe it. I'm telling you, my friends, once again, what I feel in my spirit, we need to be here at the Abundant Life Tabernacle, and I know that we are. People ought to walk in and see how godly couples are staying together, and I know that how they're making things work. And the reason, my friend, we need to protect marriage, number one, because of the government, and number two, Satan is looking to destroy your marriage each and every day. Don't the Bible say, be not, be not ignorant of his devices? Talk about unforgiveness when you study the context of that. We don't need to be ignorant of His devices. And we also understand it is God's will to keep our marriages whole. Now before I move into, before I move into the book of Proverbs, I've got to address a question that has came up to me probably three times when I was looking at pastor in this church. And it wasn't for here. But I had somebody come to me, you cannot pastor Brother Derek. I said, why? Because you're too young to counsel about marriage. I said, really? Is that the reason I cannot pastor a church? It's because, why we, and then and here it came again. Somebody else said, how can you talk to somebody who's been married 80 years? How can you talk to them about, about your marriage when you've only been married four? Well, you know, Paul wrote about marriage and he was never married. Amen. That was Paul. He didn't have it. He won't marry, but he still thought pretty good to touch on it, didn't he? You would tell you why? It's the mind of God. The reasons today I can preach about marriage and I'm young, number one is the Bible. It teaches about marriage, and I don't have to be married 50 years to preach on that. Amen? Praise God. Not only that, I can also preach about marriage because the Holy Ghost can show me things. Not only that, I have my own little bit of experience in marriage. And number four, there are centuries of history that we can be studying and mistakes we can learn from. We can teach about marriage no matter what age you are if you're able to comprehend what the Word is saying. All right, I just want to touch that in case somebody thought that. Amen. Not saying you did. So today when we move into the book of Proverbs, we are going to talk about six things that will protect your marriage. Six different things that will help your marriage. And I want to just touch on this before we go any further. I am not going to deal with some elementary points. I'm not going to deal with uh, you need Jesus in your marriage because you should know that. Number one, if you're not saved today, if you want your marriage to work, get born again. 
And even if, you're, even if your loved one's not saved or your spouse's not saved, the Bible gives us a pattern how you can live a good, sanctified life and you can help them even be reached. The Bible does tell that. Understand this today, my friend. Not only that, you need Jesus in your marriage. You need to attend church to help your marriage work. And also you need to understand sin destroys your marriage. So that's just elementary things we're not going to go over today. But here in the book of Proverbs, I want you to look at these different verses with me as we go throughout this book and teach and preach this. This is basically a study on Proverbs and marriage. Number one today, keep this in mind. Number one, in order to make your marriage protected, in order to make your marriage work, protect your marriage by making it one of your first priorities. Now we understand my relationship with God is prioritized above my relationship with my wife. But if I get this one right, that one will get right, won't it? Amen. If I love the Lord thy God with all my heart, I can love my neighbor. I can love my wife. If this relationship is right, 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 hear me today, you've got to work on this one first. Understand, you've got to make it your first priority. When we look at marriage, I want you to see this with me in the book of Proverbs 13 and 10. I'm going to try to move, try to move along. You may not be able to catch me the whole time. But hear me today, priority number one is this. You've got to remove pride out of your marriage in Proverbs 13 and 10. Proverbs 13 and 10. Says this, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Now, notice today it says, only by pride comes contention, only by pride comes this conflict. This verse describes somebody who's full of strife because they are full of pride and full of presumption. Now, get this we know what pride means, it means that kind of haughtiness. But when you look at this word pride up in the Bible and you study it out in this context, it means actually presumption. And what that word perception means, it's this attitude that you're right. It's this attitude that is nobody's business. It is a blind assertion about things. Pretty much just when the preacher preaches on marriage and you would say something like this. My marriage is fine. Stay out of my business. That's presumption and pride. It's when somebody says something like this. Hey, stay out of my marriage. And that's it right there. That's, that's what Solomon's talking about. It's when somebody says something like this. It will be fine. It will work its way out. And my friend, you just proved the point that that came to your mind. It is not my business, but it is God's business. It's not my business, but it is God's business. Understand that today. You say, well, it's not your business to this person's business, but it is his business and it is his spouse's business. Amen. Now, you look at God and tell him it's not none of your business. And he might say, well, I gave you breath to breathe. I woke you up today. I let all, you know, all the benefits that he gives us. So hear me today, my friend. We've got to remove pride out of our marriage. Not only that, we've also got to make, we've got to get pride out of our marriage as a priority. But in Proverbs 15 and 17, I want you to hear this. Love is a priority in our marriage. It says in Proverbs 15 and 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and the hatred therewith. Now, can you imagine coming home and your wife said, hey, Got dinner ready. What you got, sweetie? Herbs. It don't, don't sound too appeasing to me. I, I don't know. I, I, even when they did the last Passover, they had eaten bitter herbs and all that. It never seemed appeasing. Could you imagine coming home and all of a sudden there on the table is a smorgasbord of just a bunch of different herbs? What the Bible is saying here is this. You're better off eating a plate full of herbs with a wife where there's love. Then you have in prime rib and a baked potato with a strife. Hey Amen. You know what? I would tell you today, it doesn't matter how big your house is. It doesn't matter, it don't matter how good your cooking or food is. How pretty your car is. If you don't have love, you don't have nothing. Hey Amen. That's what Solomon is saying here. Herbs at that time was not the best dinner in comparison to a nice steak. But the verse shows us that happiness has little to do with the type of food or the type of, the type of possessions you have. It has to do with love. It has to do with love. It does not matter if you live in a mansion today. If you don't have love, you have misery in your life. You ever met a, a relationship or a couple? They just assume by spoiling each other that their relationship is going to thrive and is going to make it. So you watch the husband, which if you're able to get things, I'm not against that. You know what I'm saying. But you see the husband constantly buying and hoarding and buying and hoarding, and he's never content. You know what it is? He's trying to fill that void where there should be love that makes him whole. 
Now there's some women that will go on shopping sprees. There's some women that do this just to try to fill that void. But let me tell you, my friend, if you don't have two red pennies to rub together and you have a good relationship with your husband, you'll find peace and joy that the millionaire doesn't have. You'll have peace and joy you can't find at the shopping mall. You'll have peace and joy that you'll never have with a Range Rover or a cattle. I'm telling you, my friend, if you have love, it can make up a multitude of things that you're craving for. I've sat at a table with a millionaire before, I, no joke, he's a man that owned a company, and I ate with him, and the fellowship was, ah, he was all right. But I sat in Africa in huts and ate goat and drank water and had better fellowship there. You would tell you why? The love of God was there. I had more in common with that peasant pastor overseas than I had in common with the millionaire in America. You would tell you it was missing the love of God. Let me challenge you today, if you're missing that fellowship of love in your home, I would today that you'd give it to God. I would today that you would backtrack. I would today that you would look and begin to examine what needs to be done in your heart about this. Now understand this, Proverbs 18 and 22 says this. It talks about marriage is our priority because it is God's idea. Proverbs 18 and 22 says this. Whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So it's saying here basically in this, who you find as a wife find it's a good thing. Once again, we need to preach and teach the sanctity of marriage. God is holy. Marriage was His idea. So marriage is supposed to be holy. Is that fair to say if our God is a holy God, that He has holy ideas? And that when He makes those ideas formulate, that idea that He made formulate like marriage is holy? Your marriage is to be holy. You're not to conform to this world in your marriage. You've got to understand marriage is something that is still to be holy in the eyes again. Understand, when God in the Garden of Eden there, when God created that woman for Adam in the Bible, we know that we know that Adam was there, he was alone. God said that was not good for man to be alone. There God created Eve out of his rib. So everything that Adam needed, notice this, everything that Adam needed at that time, it was informulated in the life of Eve. God created it to where them two could come together. Eve was what Adam needed, and Adam was what Eve needed. Let me tell you what you really need. Well, number one, we all know, keep Jesus number one. You know what you need in your marriage? You need to understand your wife or your husband can help lead you to completeness if you hold hands and you do the will of God together. You've got to understand that. It's not the will of God for the, this person to come to church and not that one. And they, this one wants to be there. Not, it ain't the will of God that you argue in the car all the way to church. Hey, man, I've done it, and I felt bad about it. It ain't the will of God that you leave church. You worship, you know, out of the same mouth, James says, for blessed, for sweet and bitter waters. No, sir, it ain't the will of God that you leave church, and you argue the whole way home in front of the kids, and you're showing them a wonderful example of marriage. No, you're not. You're not. It wouldn't be right for me nor you, because God wants that marriage to be whole. God wants it to be. I told my wife as I looked at that little baby in that crib. I said, God forbid if we raise this baby in a home full of arguing and strife and contention. God forbid. It makes me fearful. What if she sees that? And then she begins to emulate what we did. And then we wonder why 50% of marriages don't make it in America. I'll tell you why. Because mom and dad's marriage was pathetic. Say another way to point it. I don't know how else to say it. Make sure it's whole. Make sure that's God. It was God's idea, my friend. When God created us in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, then it was God's idea. Hear me today, my friend. He created a man and He created a woman and that was the order that He created it. You ever heard the saying, He didn't create Adam and Steve. He created Adam and Eve. That's what we believe about marriage. You've got a man and a woman. They were created in the, get this, both of them in the image of God. I hope you know, men, that you ain't the only ones in the image of God. The ladies are too. But I want you to understand this, ladies, as well. That doesn't mean you have the same role as the man. Even though we're both in the image of God, there is a gender distinction in this room today. You're a man or you're a woman. So we would understand today when God created Adam and Eve, they were, even though they're both in the image of God, they are both different genders, we would understand today that anything that tries to eradicate gender distinction is evil and against the wisdom of God. 
Amen. Women, men, act like women and act like men. That's all it is to it. I'm not the big I'm not a big fan of the effeminate movement in the men. I wore pink and it was on my wedding day, and I'm not against men wearing pink. I really ain't. If you wear pink, I promise, don't take that the wrong way. I got good friends wear pink and don't bother me one bit. But she had a tough time getting that tie around my neck. I just wasn't a big fan of it. I, and I've and I, I wore pink since then, to be honest with you. But at that time, that was a, that was a big step for me. My daddy wouldn't let me wear it. Amen. And we, we're from the backwoods of North Carolina. He not said he wouldn't have let me, but he picked on me when I did. You can wear pink if you want. But act like a man. <laughs> Act like a man. I won't get on it. Please don't take that wrong. I feel bad sometimes. <laughs> and women, act like a woman. Gender distinction in America. You ever heard of the unisex movement? We're living in the peak of it. Where it tries to do its best to erase all identity with a woman. And so everything that identifies with the man they try to erase. So they have a big conglomeration that men can wear girl stuff and girl can wear men stuff. And the girl can say, anything you can do, sir, I can do it better. Never the will of God. Gender distinction. we got two different bathrooms. A boy bathroom and a girl bathroom. They're trying to do away with that. Gender distinction is important. And we've got to do our best as a holiness church to uphold that. Women, dress like women. Men, dress like men. We've got to understand there is a distinction. So anything that attacks the distinction between sexes, it says attitude, clothing, hair, dispositions, women acting masculine, men acting effeminate, we've got to be careful, my friend, that we do not erase the line because what may not be a big deal today, just imagine what it's going to be 20 years later. Anything this generation does in modesty, the next generation will do it in excess. Anything this generation does in modesty, the next generation will do it in excess. Let's be careful that we make sure there is a difference. Hear me today, my friend. Men and women, it is the will of God that you give, be it as the mind of God for marriage, you need to give your best efforts, you need to give your best energies, you need to give everything to your marriage. It should be your first priority. That's point number one, and there's five more, and I'm not going to go over all of them today. Just one more. Number two, protect your marriage by admitting your human bent. Protect your marriage by admitting your human bent. Does any, has anybody ever had a cow lick on their hair? Anybody? I, I get a cow lick. If I lay down at night and I go to sleep, I wake up the next day, there's hair in the back that sticks up. And I tell you, you could have enough gel in the Atlantic Ocean and it wouldn't stay down. I get cow licks, man, and I hate them. I've had them so bad at times, I've had to go to the barber and say, can you cut this thing out? I've had to get them to do it a few times. It's something that will not be tamed. And we've got to understand today, apart from the grace of Jesus and apart from the blood of Jesus, your human nature cannot be tamed. It has to be to Christ. So we have to admit, number two, that you are a human bent. It is something in us when we study the Bible, you can, you can refute it or not, you can study the Bible, there's certain tendencies that women have, and there's certain tendencies that men have, and the Bible begins to distinguish them, and it begins to label them throughout Scripture, even in the book of Proverbs. Now, before I get into this, this part of the lesson, I don't want anybody here to think that I'm going to try to attack one gender over the other, I've preached things like this before, and the guys will go, ooh, to the girls. And I've had guys and women go, that's he's talking to you, honey. I'm not trying to do that. Please, if you're going to talk to each other about that, wait till you get in the car. Amen. I'm not, that's not my goal here. But the, we understand in the Bible, I'm going to deal with you women first, and then we're going to come to the men, I promise. Don't, don't, don't get mad at me. When we read the book of Proverbs, this is what the book of Proverbs says. Proverbs 27 and 15. A continual dropping on a very rainy day, and a contentious woman are alike. That's what the Bible says. Then it goes on to say, in Proverbs 27 and 16, Whosoever hideth her, hideth the wind, and the ointment of his right hand, which be wearing itself. So here is, we have this tendency in women to nag. And that's the word they use in commentaries. I just didn't make that up. 
Women have a tendency, and please women, don't get mad at me. My wife's back there and everything. I ain't just doing this because, amen. Women have a tendency to nag when we read the Bible. Notice this is a continual dropping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman or like. I studied this. And the houses at that time, when they were building, of course, they weren't the best construction. Some of them had stone walls, but the roofs, the ceilings on the house and the rooftops on the house were not the best. Sometimes it was used, they used sticks, sometimes they used different things to try to make it work. And every now and then, when it rained good and hard, good and hard, they'd be laying there and you hear something go, drip, 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 drip. Do you get the point? You ever been there? And so, they would go up on the rooftops and it would be hard to even trace the leak where it's coming from. So here it says, a continual dropping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman or a life. You cannot stop them. Is what the Bible is saying. Now, if you're a contentious woman here today, it's something you need to pray about. It is. It's not the will of God that you verbally abuse your children or your husband. And with the gender distinction nowadays disappearing men, it's not the will of God for you to do it either. You've got to understand, it's not the will of God to sit there and be contentious and to be nagging. Notice all those sounds like a drop of water, but then it goes on and says, it's like trying to confine the wind. Have you ever tried to confine the wind outside? Good luck. You can't do it. Then it talks about like ointment in your right hand. Can you imagine if I wouldn't dip my hand in a thing of perfume? And all of a sudden, I dipped in a big old gallon of perfume and I brought it to the church and I was trying to hide the smell. You can't do it. It's saying that a contentious woman cannot be hushed. She cannot be stopped. So hear me today, my friend. The Bible shows us here that women, that unborn again women, and women that begin to lean toward the flesh and lean on the arm of flesh, have the ability and the habit to nag their husbands. And look here, you may not be the verbal type. You know, some people say, well, I didn't say anything. That look counts too. It does. You can be nagging. Not you, I, as a pastor, you, you, you get nagged as a pastor. Not here, but I have before. Here, somebody make a sharp gesture. You're like, oh, thank you. But that look and that attitude can have the same weight as your words. We don't believe in the duct tape treatment either. Just don't talk about it. Just don't talk to each other for two weeks. That ain't the will of God. No. We have to understand, this is something the Bible goes on to say, a virtuous, in Proverbs 12 and 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh a shame is as rottenness in his bones. So it says here, a virtuous woman is as a crown, and is a valued symbol of status, but if she is not, if she's somebody that is not virtuous, it says that maketh a shame, and is as rottenness to his bones, the idea here is like some kind of terminal sickness that eats away at his very bones. When a woman is not, you ever you ever met somebody like that? That somebody that I, I know don't don't look at your neighbor or anybody. I'm just saying, you ever met somebody that had that ability that, they, that their attitude was so sour and so bad that it just bothered you to your core. And if you weren't saved, you're sitting thinking, Lord, give me strength because I know I haven't done nothing wrong. I know this. So we have to be careful. I, I read a survey one time and we're moving along. And this, there was a survey towards men and it said this. In the survey it says, would you rather be alone and unloved or would you rather be inadequate and disrespected? 74% of men said, I'd rather be alone and unloved than be in a relationship where I feel inadequate and disrespected women. Do your best to respect your husbands where you can and do your best to make that relationship what it should be. Number two, as we, as we move into this, women tend to nag their husbands, but men tend to neglect their wives. Just in the Bible where there's as much about, about a woman that, that is very boisterous and boisterous, there's even more in the Bible about husbands who are neglectful. We read throughout Scripture and we understand there's so much in the Bible about this that in the American culture, there is this image when you look at Hollywood or these different things, there's an image of a man that cannot wait to get away, get away from his wife. You ever see Hollywood tries to make things look like that? Like the husband can't just wait to get, I can't wait to go do this because I just got to get away from my wife. That's not the will of God, men. I don't understand. I understand sometimes it's good to go out and do different things. But if you don't just get away from your wife because she aggravates you so bad, you need to pray about it. You need to do something about it. The Bible says this in Proverbs 27 and 8, As a bird that wandereth from her nest, 
So is a man that wandereth from his place. We understand that a nest is a home to a bird. And the same thing here what Solomon's trying to show us, just as a bird would wander from his nest, men had that tendency to begin to forsake and begin to let down and begin to neglect their household, their family, and their children. My God, do not let that be. It is your calling as men and women, if you're married, if you're not married, you're looking to get, it's your calling to make that marriage work and to raise those children in the fear of God. I'm going to give you five things real quick. Five things real quick that prove that you're neglecting your wife if you do these things. If you give one word answers to heartfelt questions, it's not the will of God. Your wife comes to you and she has this long, she has a story, she has something she's trying to tell you. And all of a sudden, you just throw one word out there when really you owe her a paragraph, at least. At least. So you're ne- neglecting your wife if you give her one word answers to heartfelt questions. Number two, you're neglecting your wife if you hide your feelings and only state facts when you're forced. You ever met men that only want to state the facts, but never state their feelings? They're the kind of people who say, well, the bills are due. Well, the children this, the house is dirty. Well, it's this or it's that or it's this or it's that. And they can only state facts, but they never show you how they really feel inside. That's number two. Number three, if you're a man here today and you refuse to schedule that one-on-one time with your wife, you're neglecting your wife. Ask your wife out on a date. Then write it on the calendar and go. That's all right. It's all right to do these things. Number four, you neglect your wife if you do things that are hurtful and you show no remorse. If you do things that are hurtful and you show no remorse. Remorse. Men, it's not all right just to open your mouth and say something hurtful to your wife and then later on act like it never bothered you. You know what? It may have shattered her world. Women, same thing. You can't do that. Number five, and in closing, closing, you're neglecting your wife when she ends up not being your first choice with good news or things in your life. You'll tell everybody else about it, but you won't tell her about it. If you would stand to your feet, I hope you received something from God's Word. And uh, we're going to do what I feel led to do in my spirit and praying about this. I don't know if God's just allowed me to preach this or put this in my heart. I don't know why. If it's just informative or if you're here today and you know that your marriage is not what it's supposed to be. I'm telling you, my friend, it is the will of God that you work it out.